So, we're winding down summer, and it is uh, the last couple of sermons uh, in the book of Psalms. How's your Psalms reading goes? Mr. Otto read through the Psalms three times this summer. Uh, he did it. He was busy. He was in and out of the hospital. He moved. He was a busy man. So he was counting on you all to do read through the Psalms and help him out. So everyone's read through the Psalms almost by now, right? Everyone? If not, that's okay. You've got the rest of your life. They're still in the Bible. You can go ahead and read them through. But today we're coming to Psalm 91. Psalms are songs in the key of life and our one purpose, remember, the purpose of the Psalms, right, is to teach us the honest conversation of the heart addressed to God. I promised last week I wouldn't make you do the quiz, and so I guess I can't do it even though I want to. The honest conversation of the heart addressed toward God. That brings us to Psalm 91. If you remember our three keys, the, the keys are to help us no matter where we're at in Psalms to understand what's going on. The first one is of orientation. Things are good, right? And I understand God and life, and so the Psalm reflects that. There are Psalms of profound disorientation where nothing in, se- in life makes sense, right? You can't make sense out of God, out of the world, out of yourself, out of your own life. Those are Psalms of disorientation. We've had a couple of those in a row. This week, we have a psalm of reorientation. This is when the person writing the psalm is looking back over something, and they realize, right, that life takes on new meaning. God has been there, and I have learned something, or I'm declaring something about God because I've experienced it, and now I know it. Right? And that's what Psalm 91 is about this morning. There was an amazing woman. I didn't know her really well. Personally, I'd met her a couple of times, but I heard about her when I was 13 years old. Uh, and I heard her tell this story live at a big rally uh, down in Ohio uh, with a whole bunch of students. I was probably one of the youngest kids there. It was mostly college students. And uh, she was a nun. Her name was Sister Joan. And she was talking about the power of the Holy Spirit. And she was telling a story. Uh, she was moved to, to a new place. Sometimes as, a, as a, a nun or a priest, you get moved, and they tell you where to go, and you have to go. She was in a, a new home, new house with her other sisters, and she liked to walk, and so she was walking the neighborhood. And they warned her not to go past this one big house because they had attack dogs. They weren't just like guard dogs. They were attack dogs. Uh, and they had mauled a couple of people uh, in the past. Uh, this would have been back in the early 80s, late 70s. And, um, and so she was kind of afraid. Uh, but she just felt like as she walked and she prayed that God wanted her to walk by and pray. And this one morning, it just so happened that the gate was open. And uh, these two dogs, they were kind of a mix of Rottweilers and something else, kind of fighting dogs, uh, came bounding across this property towards her at the road. And they were, they meant business. And she said, if you ever heard the phrase, the fear of God, right, they did put the fear of God in her. She knew that if those dogs reached her, she was almost literally dead meat. The way That's what she said, dead meat. Uh, because they would just maul her. So she stood... And she said, in a moment, I don't know where it came from, just the Holy Spirit put it in me. And I said, stop in the name of Jesus. And those dogs that were on a full run, as soon as they got to the road, they just stopped and they sat down. And she was kind of dumbfounded. She told them to do it. She half expected it not to work and half expected it to work. And they sat down. And she said, from that day forward, I never doubted that if I believed and took God as my protector, that God would protect me. Even in times of actual, real, physical danger and any other time, that if I put my trust solely in the Lord, that he would protect me. And that's what we're going to discover in Psalm 91 this morning. So, my question to you is, 
What is the most danger you have ever been in? When is that moment? The most danger. Might have been physical danger. Could have been spiritual, emotional, psychological, whatever. We've all, our moments of danger are all different. But when was that time when you felt absolutely helpless and vulnerable? That's what Psalm 91 is calling up for us today. Page 409 in your Bibles, if you picked one up on the cart. By the way, if you don't have one, please be welcome to one. Uh, take it home with you. Use it as your own. If you know someone that needs a Bible, take one, give it to them. We'll, we'll get really good at this. You'll be able to give the spiel uh, in the next couple months. Uh, but that's what they're there for. Page 409 in Psalm 91. Let's pray as we open God's Word together this morning. God, your, your word reminds us that our help is in the name of the Lord. And that you are our help. A very present help in the time of need. And even though right now, Lord, we all feel probably physically safe sitting here in this place, we know that there is a world and certainly your enemy the devil who wants and seeks our ruin the closer that we come to you. And so we come to your word confessing that we need help. Maybe, Lord, the thing we need help in most is realizing in our comfortable North American lives that we live in danger, spiritual, emotional, and otherwise. And that we need you as our Savior. So as we open your word this morning, Holy Spirit, change us. Open our eyes so that not only could we see that we need you, would you help us to put our trust and faith totally in you because of Jesus who is faithful to give everything that we might come not only under the protection but the salvation of God through Jesus in whose name we pray. Amen. Psalm 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler, that's the, the bird catcher, someone who catches birds, the fowler's snare, and from the daily pestilence, the plague, right? He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near to you. You only will observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you, if you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the Most High your dwelling, then no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift, up, they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, and this is God's promise, I will rescue him. I will protect him. For he acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble and deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this is a great psalm. Isn't it kind of interesting? There's different ways that the psalmist is talking. Sometimes the psalmist is talking to us, and then the psalmist begins to talk to God directly, and then the Holy Spirit is giving the psalmist a promise, right, for us. And so that's kind of the three general, this psalm is broken into three general parts. So, uh, verse 1 uh, through verse 8, sorry. And then verse 9 
through 13, and then verse 14 and 16. So those are the three different parts. The first one begins talking uh, uh, in, in an interesting way. Verse 1, what's the first word of that verse? Psalm 91, verse 1, first word. Whoever, right? Whoever dwells. That's conditional. Did you, did you kind of catch that? It doesn't say everyone gets this, what's about to happen. It's, it's telling you what is about to happen. Whoever dwells, right, in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. So the promise in the second half of the verse this person will rest in the shadow of the Almighty, is conditional. Did you catch that? The condition is, is that you have to dwell where? In the shelter of the Most High. This is what Sister Joan was trying to get across to me when she was telling us about her encounter with those dogs. Right? God wants to be our protector. But it's conditional. A little later on, it will go to call God our fortress. In verse 2, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, which is a place of safety, right? And my fortress, my God in whom I trust. So I want you to think of this. Imagine a castle. A medieval castle is fine, you know, storybook castle with a moat and all of that kind of stuff. That is a protective building, right? They were built that way to keep out danger, right? A lot of times they had a moat or maybe it was built up on a cliff or a mountainside, but it was so that people couldn't get to it. And just in case they could, assailing armies, right, they built huge walls, thick walls, and there was all kinds of defensive things around them. Right? You with me? Remember back that far maybe in history or dial up your favorite movie from that time period? Right? A castle, a fortress. Now, who's protected? The person inside the fortress or outside the fortress? Right? That's what the psalm is saying. You have to put your faith and trust in God who is your fortress, which means you've got to go dwell in there. Right? You with me so far? That's the metaphor. If you make your dwelling outside of God, then you're not going to receive the protection that God is and provides for us. But what does that look like in your life? Let me tell you about my friend, Frank. Frank is one of my best friends. Scripture has a, I love this, this way of describing a friend, uh, this is a friend that's closer than a brother or a sibling. Frank is closer to me than my own family. I met Frank when, uh, I, actually I think it was last week, I told you that our church plant got closed, right? Which meant that I was unemployed. Not only that, I was an unemployed pastor, which is one of the least employable people on the face of the earth. Especially in a very pagan, non-churchy place like Washington. And, you know, for about a month or two I was, you know... I had a case of uh, something called stinking thinking, and I just could not wrap my mind and heart around what was going on. And finally, in prayer, after I told God that I'd surrender and I'd fail if he wanted him to, he kind of put it in my heart to go to the Boy Scout office and to volunteer. I'm like, all right, I'd been a Boy Scout, and I thought, you know, great. If I'm not employed, at least I can help somebody. I walk into this place. You know what I did? This is, you get to know me a little bit. I wanted to help them with fundraising because that's what I thought I was being sent there to do. So I put on my best suit, you know. I mean, really, like a nice suit. Power suit. I was ready to go in and tell them what I could do for them. And so I found their address and I went, and it was a rather unimpressive building, I have to say. It was a little run down. Uh, it's kind of a modular, actually, office. So it was kind of, that was built in the early 80s, and uh, it was 
looked like I needed a little love. I'm looking, I'm like, boy, these folks could really use some fundraising help. I can tell already. I must be in the right place. I walk in the front door, and there's nobody there. There's just a rack of literature. There's kind of a store, a little store, tiny uh, storage room, really, that was turned into a store to my right, conference table, and then there's some offices to the left. I'm looking around. There's nobody, so I just start walking around and kind of, you know, looking at stuff and remembering Boy Scouts. And I'm like, great, this is fun. I remember. And I'm like, how am I going to be able to help around here? And I'm looking. And uh, so I kind of peek around the corner where the offices were. There was nobody there. There was three or four, like, cubicles, but you could tell that no one was working there. They were just kind of vacant. But there was a light on in one of the offices. So I walked down, and there, a guy saw me, and he jumped up. So, hello. You could tell that he was concerned in doing something else, but he, when he saw me, he kind of put his professional face on. How can I help you today? He came out, and uh, I walked into his office. He had little signs all over that could tell, I could tell that he was a Christian. His Bible was on his desk, and he had a uh, thing. and said, oh, I, you know, just coming in to see how I could help, if I could volunteer. Uh, and he said, well, tell me about yourself. And so I told him, I eventually told him I was a pastor, he looked at me, he sat back down behind his desk in his chair, and he just, he said, you know how you could help me? Could you pray for me? Frank had just been given a 90-day warning that he was going to get fired because he hadn't raised enough money. It was seriously hundreds of thousands of dollars below uh, his quota for fundraising. Uh, his, because of that, there was tension in his marriage. There was all kinds of things going on in his life. And Frank had just been crying out to God for somebody, for, for help. God, help me. And I thought I was going to go do something great. And God was saying, I just want you to go be a pastor of this one guy. Can you do that for me? And so that began a partnership between Frank and I. And I got to tell Frank that I didn't have it all together either, right? And we started to pray. And I put in 40 hours a week with Frank. 40 hours a week. And we did fundraising events, and we did training, and we did all kinds of stuff. But most of all, we prayed. We prayed together all of the time. He had a boss that wanted to fire him, but couldn't. Frank has Hispanic background, and so he didn't want to fire a minority in case he got a wrongful termination suit. He had everything stacked against him. His wife, which was his second wife, who um, she was kind of forced into the marriage. She felt forced into the marriage. She had two teenage daughters. She was abandoned by her husband. Frank was a good guy, kind of took them on, but she really didn't love Frank. And now it looked like the provision that he was able to give their family was going to go away, and she wanted out of the marriage. Everything was stacked against him. One thing held firm. He said, I, know the, I don't know how it's going to happen, but I know the Lord will not abandon me, but I need help. And so Frank and I prayed. And Frank came up with this prayer. God is going to be my promoter. I'm not going to look to the Boy Scouts. I'm not going to ask God to send a new boss. I'm not, I am going to trust in the Lord. And doors began to open. And Frank and I went to people that had given hundreds of thousands of dollars before, and they started writing checks for ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars 20000 We put on breakfasts and fundraising events and we did all of the stuff and little by little things started to change in 90 days he made his quota in 90 days he made his quota not a lot not the whole thing but just enough to save his job and then frank said thank you lord please help me with his marriage and so we prayed about his marriage and you know what it didn't turn around she ended up leaving frank uh but he said you know what lord i I'm going to get my needs met through you. I'm not going to try to get my needs met by this woman who doesn't want to be in this marriage. So help me to know what to do, but I'm going to need get my needs met by you, but I'm going to offer her everything that I can and help her. He became really good friends, and he always has been with her parents, praying for her, and he graciously let her go. Even after she divorced him, he let him live in her house and he, with her two daughters, and he moved out. And it was killing him financially. He m made very little money and still does. Uh, but he said, you know what? God has brought them under my roof, and I know that God will provide. And little by little, 
his boss quit under actually quite a cloud. And we began to minister to people through Boy Scouts together. And Frank said, God is my promoter. He said, I'm going to choose joy. I thought that I was going to help this guy, and he was showing me what it looks like when all the chips are down. His parents died during that year. His wife had left him. His job was in jeopardy. There was all kinds of things against Frank. His finances weren't... uh, (laughs) At the end of the month, there's no way they could. And he just put his trust in the Lord and chose joy. And he he taught me what it looked like in the face of adversity to trust in the Lord. I had nothing to offer except I needed to learn the lesson that Frank helped me watch as he learned it himself. Eventually, Frank got five promotions and became kind of the second-hand person. We got, he got a new boss. This is over several counties, a big territory, thousands of people. And we gathered some other prayers and scouting, and we, turned, we sold properties, and for millions of dollars, we went to a Supreme Court lawsuit case, all of this stuff, because this man trusted in the Lord, not only for himself, but then also That God would reach through scouting every single person, every family. Right? And it came to a point where you think the story's going to get better, right? Mr. Otto knows better. No, it's not. Frank got cancer. Now he's living alone. His wife has left him. He's got no one to help him. He he, uh, has all of these people that he's responsible for. His quota for fundraising and all kinds of other things is more than quadrupled, but he doesn't have any help. Just me, his volunteer, and a few other volunteers that really believed. And now he's got cancer. So he said, I am going to choose joy. Right? And he went into every cancer treatment, praying for everyone, trying to cheer everyone up. I, he didn't have anybody else in his life. Stacy and I, we took him, went, he had a, a, a surgery as well. We went with him, took him home, got him food, his empty house, his wife took, his ex-wife took everything except for a folding table, a chair, uh, a, uh, a recliner, his bed. That's all he had in his house. And he's recovering from cancer this way. Full of the joy of the Lord, Not knowing whether he was going to live or die, he was terrified. Right? And then he comes out completely fine. Right? Cancer's gone. He goes through his treatments, and you think it's going to get better, don't you? But he began to trust so much that God was going to be his protector that no matter what came, he was fine. He was no longer scared. Frank started teaching all of us what it looked like. He found this group and this thing called Choosing Joy. And he said, Brandon, I want you to experience what I, you've watched it, we prayed, but I want you to choose joy. He said, you're moving through life and you're doing it with faith, but man, you're kind of a sad sack. We could be more joyful together. And I thought, man, if there's anybody I can learn this from, it's Frank. So he was teaching me that, and guess what? He had to have a shoulder replacement, and then a knee replacement. And then guess what? We were doing some, so much turnaround at the Boy Scouts of America that they had to fire half the staff. So now they couldn't still get rid of Frank because now he's on disability, right? He's under protection, so they can't get rid of him. Now, but what they did is got rid of five of his staff members, and he still has to do all of their job, even though he's still recovering from cancer and all of this stuff. So all of the people that had been praying with Frank and he had been teaching are rallying around Frank, volunteers coming out of his ears. He can't even go into the office. And we're trying to do this. You think it gets better, don't you? But it doesn't. They restructure. And so Frank, who was just about ready to get the biggest promotion to become like an executive director, he'd have to move somewhere and he'd been applying for it and I'd been encouraging him but the Lord just did not open that door. They restructured, got rid of his position, and he lost two rungs, which represented about 15 years' worth of pension money. I mean, this is a really serious consequences. He rented out his house, moved into an apartment 
in kind of a slum, in a really hard place in town. Uh, he's renting out his house. He's living, and he's praising God, looking for a church that he can now bless. And he said, I am going to make sure that every person who works with me and even my boss knows that Jesus loves him. Frank prayed Stacy and I through many things, and I'm going to stop talking about Frank because I'm going to start crying. Uh, he was an amazing person to me. This is what it looks like. You know, the, the, the language in Psalms sometimes can be a little bit, you know, removed from our daily life. This is what it means. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. There was only one place in all of those circumstances where Frank was going to be able to find peace and rest. And that is because he just let it all go. He stopped trying to save his marriage, his job, all of it. He stopped trying to find a promotion. He stopped trying. All he was focused on was, I am going to love everybody with the joy of the Lord the best that I can every day. That's what it looks like, second part of the verse, would it, you rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, which I heard Frank do many times, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And you know what? Everyone who knows Frank knows that is true about him. And nobody goes away from Frank without getting blessed somehow. So, the psalm goes on. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. Right? This is dialing up for Israel all of the things that they had gone through. Right? They had been overtaken right, by other kings and kingdoms. They fought many, many wars and battles. They had gone through sickness and plague and disease and drought. And the psalmist is trying to help them understand things that they've experienced in their life. And so he's saying... There is nothing that God won't do for you. They lived in a walled city. They lived in a protected fortress. And the psalmist is saying, it's not the wall. It's not the city. God is your protector. And so he switches and says to them, under his wings, right? He switches the metaphor. I want you to start thinking about a bird, a mother bird, right? And you will be saved from everything. The second part, the second chunk. The second chunk starts in verse 9. How does it start? The first three words. Help me out. Verse 9. If you say. Same way that the first verse started out. It's conditional, right? You got to do something first. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the most high your dwelling, then what's going to happen? No harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. Meaning, even those things that are you know, most dangerous in nature, you'll be fine against. But then it says something else. Then you will trample the great lion and the serpent. You know what that's about? Talk about Satan there. Not only Satan, but also the great kingdoms that meant Israel harm. Not only will he protect you from physical harm, but he will protect you from all spiritual harm. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, the psalmist is inviting us to put our faith and our trust in God. Great. You knew that as a Christian, probably, if you've been around church long enough, right? Put your faith and trust in God. Anybody not heard that? I didn't think so. What's the last word on the slide up there? Changes that phrase, isn't it? We are invited to put our faith and trust in God alone. Here's a good lit litmus test. Have you ever looked at your bank account and either thought that you were safe or unsafe? Oh, things are going to be fine this month because either I have enough in my bank account or things are not going to be fine because I don't have enough money in my bank account. 
we're Americans, and if you say you haven't done it at least once in your life, you're probably lying, or maybe just have a really bad memory. But that's what we do in America. We save ourselves. We pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, right? Of course, God blesses us, and we do it all through. But no, we do it ourselves. We educate ourselves, and we get good jobs, and we you know, work hard and we're faithful and we do all the things that good citizens and good Christians do and that's how we do it and we've saved carefully. We have a 401k or we, you know, maybe we don't have a 401k but we protected and we were thrifty and we used our butter containers, right, for bowls instead of buying new stuff, whatever. We've done it. What good is a savior if you're too busy to save your, saving yourself? Let's go back to our fortress picture. As Americans, you know what we say? We believe in God to save us when we die. Because we don't know what's going to happen then. We don't have control over that. So we want to go to heaven. So I put my faith in Jesus. In the meantime, I'm not going to live in that fortress who is God. I'm going to make my own dwelling outside of the walls. And that's what we do. I think it's pretty interesting that most of us as Americans, whether we own a home or not, we put, I mean, look at television. You can't look at a TV without finding home building, home, right? That is where our security is. Not in God alone. Go to a country at a place that's impoverished that doesn't have that. They live in slums or they're itinerant or they, they live in a refugee camp, right? They know what it means to have nothing else but God as their fortress. They know what it means to need a savior. We're too busy oftentimes saving ourselves. Sometimes that's our fault and sometimes it's just the water we swim in in our culture as Americans. But you know what? It doesn't matter why, it has to change. If... We want to receive all the things that come next. Here's what God's promise is to us in the following verses. <clears throat> God promises that because he loves me, says the Lord, this is what I will do. If you do these things, the Lord says this. I will rescue you. I will protect you. I will answer you. I will be with you. I will rescue you. I will honor you. Uh, that one should be saved. Uh, save you, I will honor you, I will satisfy you, I will show you. Right? That's all what, starting at verse 14. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him or her or you. Right? I will protect you, for you acknowledge my name. When you call on me, I will answer you. I will be with you in times of trouble. I will deliver you and honor you. With long life, I will satisfy you and I will show you my salvation. It's a promise. God's pretty good at keeping his promise. But what good is it if we don't need what, or want what God is promising us? We were praying this morning. And the Holy Spirit was just tugging on me. There are people in our church family, and you might be one of them, who are secret sufferers. You suffer in secret. You've got something going on in your life. It might be financial. It might be relational. I don't know what it is. But you come to church, or you go out into the world, and you put your best face on, and nobody knows that anything's wrong, or you minimize it, oh, it's fine, it's fine, and you say, God will take care of it, God will take care of it, right? You're just trying to push people away. But you cannot be a secret sufferer with God. In order to get into a fortress, you have to declare that you need one, right? You know who doesn't need a fortress? Think about Israel and kings and kingdoms. Other kings, people have set up other kingdoms for themselves. They don't need the fortress. Everybody else needs the help of the king or the queen or the protector. So whose help are you relying on this morning? 
You have to turn away from your own kingdom, those things that you've set up in your life to give you a sense of security and stability and safety in order to discover the great thing, which is all of these things that God does. Now, here's the thing. You don't have to go out and look for trouble in life. I think you probably know this by now. What you have to do is open your eyes, and I have to open my eyes to the trouble that's right around us. Because most of the time we're too busy distracting ourselves from the trouble around us, which also means we're distracted from the one who's trying to save us from that trouble. So what is it in your life right now that you need help from with God? Maybe it's your powerless to help your child who's suffering. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's your health. Do not be a secret sufferer. That's what Jesus came for, to save us, to rescue us, to protect us, to answer us, to do all of these things. But we have to take the step and allow him to become our shelter, our fortress. If you make the activity, the hours and goals of your life, to save yourself from pain or poverty or adversity, what do you need a Savior for? So this morning, let's throw away the idols of our financial security, our comfortable living, right? our predictable lives. Let's abide in Christ and allow him to take us into the daring places of our life. Right? unharmed in the protection of his powerful love. Here's the way that Paul says it in Philippians 3. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them, it's not garbage, that's the PG version that we translate, but I consider it a stinking heap of manure. Right? That's what that means. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own, but that which is found through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and even to participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, so that somehow... Attaining to the resurrection of the dead. Paul goes on to say, not that I've already attained it, right? Or that I've already arrived at that goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have been taking hold of it. But one thing I do do, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. That goal and that prize is God himself, which is why he invites us to his table. This invitation doesn't go away. Just in case we don't know what a safe place looks like, we come to the table. And Jesus, in the very hour of his most, danger, uh, his most dangerous hour, when he was about to be betrayed, arrested, tortured, brutally beaten, and given up to death, even by the ones that he loved, he made a safe place, a table, a haven, a fortress, a dwelling place. Hours before that, Jesus went to the walls in Jerusalem and said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how you kill the prophets that come within your walls, how long I have desired to gather you as a mother hen gathers her chicks under his wings, but you wouldn't have it. Let's not be among those who reject God wanting to protect us under his wings, almost like a mother bird does. And this meal is a reminder of the lengths to which God will go to give us salvation and protection. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, sat down with his disciples, and after he'd washed their feet, he took bread. 
He blessed his Father in heaven, and he broke it, saying, This is my body, which has been broken for you. Do this in memory of me. And then the same way when the meal was ended, he took the cup. Again, he blessed his Father in heaven, and he said, This is the cup of a new covenant, a new promise between us, which is made in my blood. This is the cup of salvation for forgiveness of sins, right? Whenever you gather, do this in memory of me. Friends, don't be secret sufferers. Bring all of yourself to the table. These are God's gifts for us, God's people. Come now, for all things are ready.